Good evening. It is 8 o'clock, and uh, I want to welcome everybody to this session of Introduction to Combat Commander for the San Diego HistCon Winter Quarters. My name is Patrick, and I will be your guide this evening on, hopefully, what will be the first of many journeys that you're going to take in the Combat Commander game system. I see I've got Kai here in the room. She was one of the first people to arrive, so I am doubly pleased by that. So, Kai, if I go off the rails or too far afield, I know I can count on you to bring me back into focus. So, uh, I want to thank everybody that's here. I have the wonderful honor of being, I guess, the last session of the day before the final closeout show. So, make sure, as soon as we finish here, be sure to go over to uh, Ard Wolf's closeout show with Harold and everyone. But what we're going to do here tonight, I've slotted 90 minutes for this. I think I'll probably be able to get most of it in a, just over an hour. I've got this down to a pretty good science now. One of my favorite things, aside from playing Combat Commander, of course, is I love teaching Combat Commander to new players. And I'm going to admit right up front, this is a very self-serving presentation because we had about 40 people sign up for this. And I'm hoping of the 40 people, I'm going to get a significant percentage that will want to come join us on the Combat Commander Ladder, which I've been running since 2017. It is a very relaxed community. We have a Discord server, and my job every month is to bring 100 players together, organize them into pairings to play through a scenario from one of the battle packs throughout the year. And we have a great time doing it, and we're just collecting a a whole mess of data about all these different published scenarios. So uh, just from a, a data wonk side of things, I love that as well. So hopefully this will inspire you enough not only to start playing Combat Commander, but if you want to come join us on the ladder, that is gravy as well. The way I usually do this is I just walk through, presuming that some of the way people are going to play this actively, like we do, is using Vassal. Vassal has a tremendous module for all of the Combat Commander games and battle packs in the series. They are kind of community maintained now because since we started using them so much for our ladder, we actually find little errors here and there and we make corrections and we're able to sort of breathe some new life into them and, and push them back to the Vassal community. So that is one of the unintended benefits of us using them so much every month. But I'm going to show you some of the basic tools here using the Vassal framework before I actually dive into this. And I think that will give you some of the, the framework and the context not only of, of how the Vassal module works, but also just showing you some of the game pieces at the same time. So it'll be a little different if you're playing with a physical copy on the table, but for all intents and purposes, it's pretty much the same. So I'm just going to kind of start right over here at the, the top. Just going from left to right, you have a basic toolbar that is standardized, and it's got all of the functions and features that you would need to play this either asynchronously through Vassal log files or if you want to play in real time as we do, you have the capability to change sides here. You can, we've got the connection window here for doing a network connection to get onto the Vassal server. You have charts that have been added. So we have some play aids, basic play aids, and some more numerous su support tables and terrain charts that we've added just recently with GMT's permission. We'll refer back to these here in just a little bit, of course, when we start talking about the map and the terrain. We have the uh, ability to control the time bar here, which is a significant part of this game, is time management. So we have some automation that's built into the game module, which really makes your life a lot easier when you're playing this. You have the setup window here. Since this is a scenario-based game, each one of the modules will have a series of preset historical scenarios that are saved into them and it will have all the pieces that you need right here for your disposal so you just grab them right out of the spot you don't have to constantly be going back to the main marker window which is here it's the little scout and howitzer 
and you have all of the individual pieces and markers organized by their nationalities or generic markers or order of battle that you'd be using for the game. The marker window you'll use most often during the game because it has things like fires and foxholes and all sorts of good stuff that's going to come up. You also have the cemetery here, the boneyard as we like to call it, where casualties will go. You'll notice that there are two surrender markers. That is one of the, the win conditions of this game is to eliminate enough of your opponent's units such that you will force him to surrender. We'll talk about the different ways you can win in just a couple of minutes. Then you have the individual card windows here. I'm, I'm set as the Americans right now, so I will have a card window. And the way that this module is set up is that you will draw up cards like this, right into your hand. And notice they have a border around them that says unrevealed, which means if anybody else is logged in as observer or another nationality, all they can see are the backs of the cards. So it, it adds a nice little bit of mystery and it controls the ability for other players to not see your hand of cards. You can also see across the bottom here, we have different postures, which we'll talk about, that are determining how many cards you get to hold in your hand during a particular scenario. Most of the time that is determined by the scenario card that you're playing on and it is possible to uh, there are some scenarios where you can change that. There are some neat fluid ones that are out there but for the most part those are pre-programmed from the beginning of the scenario. One person is in the attacker posture, one is in the defender posture and then you have the card management that goes along with that. We also have some tools here uh, I'm going to address later on towards the end of the session for the random scenario generation process. And then you have your basic functions for zoom, pan. You can turn units on and off so you can see the map behind them. So it's a nice little way to toggle just the units or I could toggle everything. I have other markers that are on there. I can toggle them on and off. And then we also have a nice little line of sight tool which is akin to using a piece of dental floss on the table where you're drawing a line from dot to dot it will tell you the range for your shot and also if you're encountering any obstacles or hindrance for when you're making the shot so that's a handy little tool as well so what is combat commander you're here for a reason and many of you probably have experience with one of the two progenitors of this, if I understand, and Kai can correct me on this if I'm if I'm incorrect, but our squad leader, or advanced squad leader, is one half of that, and the other half was up front, the card-based version of squad leader, and those were two great tastes that go great together. That gives you your Reese's peanut butter cup, and those two game styles came together, and Chad created Combat Commander in 2006. And here it is, we're, we're coming up on 20 years. We've got 18 years of this system. We have a new battle pack coming out, which I'm very excited about, for the Pacific box set. And it's called Island Hopping, and it's on the P500 right now. So do check that out. But it is a community, I think, that even when it's, it seems like it's dormant, it seems like it's quiet, and it's not going anywhere, there's still a large cadre of players out there. And it's well-loved for reasons. So I'm hoping that I can perhaps impart some of my enjoyment through the way that I'm teaching this to you, and it's going to get you inspired to want to go out there and try it yourself. So at this point, I'll approach the map here, and then we'll go to the counters, and then we'll talk about the cards, because in this game, the counters are pretty standard. I mean, they're, it's a tactical squad-level combat game for World War II. There's no surprise there. But because the card-driven aspect of it, it frustrates some people. Let's not lie. There are people that says, I want to be able to move this unit to this spot, and I want to do some inflating fire around at my enemy just because I can. And that's not always the way it works. The cards and the lack of cards in your hand to do such things, those simulate the friction or the fog of war that are going to prevent you from maintaining that perfect tactical plan and 
you're just not going to be able to do everything you want. So the secret for Combat Commander and all the players that I've known for years that have just, you come to a moment of zen with it, which is just go with it. Its job is to provide you a narrative and a cinematic experience of a World War II movie, not unlike the Dirty Dozen, Kelly's Heroes, or something like that, and you're just in there, and you don't know where it's going to go from the outset, but you really want to just make the best of a poor situation whenever you can. So if you go into it with that, and, and Chad even puts that in the first page of the rule book is just go with the flow, that's what you're going to enjoy about this game. Some people are still not going to enjoy it. That's fine. It's just not for them at that point. Let's talk about the order of battle here. As I mentioned, that you have different postures that you will be uh, set up in. In the base game, it came with two allied nationalities. You have the Russians and you have the Americans. And then you have the German as the Axis. And then with the release of the Mediterranean box set, which was really the other half of the original whole, that gave you the British... And then you had the Allied and Axis Minor Nations, which are kind of a, they're a catch-all for each of those. So they could be, you know, Italians or French or Finns or Romanians, whatever you need for that particular scenario. What's wonderful about the card sets in this game is they're all tuned slightly differently. So the Russians may have a certain amount of orders that are more numerous or less numerous than the Germans, perhaps. The Germans may be stronger at advancing, whereas the British might be stronger and have more numerous recovery cards. Now, I'm speaking Greek to you right now because you don't know what that context means, but suffice to say, each of those decks, they play slightly differently, which is one of the things that I love about this game because no one strategy works very well for every nationality. So we've got the, the order of battle over here on the left-hand side. It's a matrix that shows us three pieces of information. One, we have the type or quality of units that can come in as replacements. So if uh, you have a squad that breaks down into a smaller team, then it will be replaced by one of these quality of units that is often set by the scenario specifically. Down here on the left-hand side is the number of orders that you can perform from your hand. So right now the Germans have elite units, and they can perform three orders during their turn. And then that last piece of information is that they are in the recon posture. Whereas the Americans can also do three, but they have slightly lesser quality, sort of average units, and they are also in a recon posture. What I'm using here right now is a great little scenario that was created by one of our ladder members, Larry Sisson. It is meant to be something just a little, he even wrote in here, uh, hey, are you tired of using fat lip as a training scenario? And that's what I used to use all the time. And when he created this one, it's great because it's a very nice basic approach where both the units are in recon mode and it, it gradually works you towards getting used to some of these rules. So he put this together. He used, he's, this is what one of the scenario cards would look like. So he you know, recreated a scenario card specific to this. And every time you are playing one of the historical scenarios from any one of the playbooks or battle packs, you're going to get a series of cards like this. It's going to tell you the, uh, the map that you're using, a little historical flavor in the narrative, and then the two types of units and what types of... Um, force makeup they're going to have. And then as you work your way down through the setup process here, all of these are just the programmed instructions for how to set up the map and all of the individual pieces of information that you need to do before you even start the game. And then if there are any special rules, those are outlined down in that special rules section. So once you have the order of battle, you can see that's going on. You can then move on. You see this is 1944. Uh, of the scenarios, for obvious reasons, will run from 1939 to 1945. And then I mentioned the time track here. So Combat Commander is a little different than most tactical war games in the fact that 
you don't really have a good idea of what the, the time represents. A game can go very briskly, or it could feel like it's taking hours and hours. Some people will play... I had a game just the other night. It went about 35 minutes of playtime, and then there are some people that will play for four and a half hours. Now, you have to factor in thinking time and corrections and all that good stuff, but at the heart of the game here is this time track where the time track will be prescribed to start at a certain point here, and then we'll have a sudden death at the other end of it. And once the time advances, you will go through a series of steps to do a little bit of upkeep. And then when you eventually get to sudden death here, you will start making check as to whether or not that game's going to end immediately. With sudden death here, you'll make a check. It's possible that you'll go to the next time, and then next time you'll keep making checks. And at that point, whoever is leading on the victory point chart is going to be the winner. The game can end in a variety of ways. That's the most common one, is hitting sudden death. Or, if one manages to exit voluntarily all of his units off of the opponent's side of the map, and he's leading in victory points, well, the game will end and he will win by victory points at that point. The other way is... You can, just coming back to to the surrender markers where I was talking about, if you inflict enough casualties per the scenario card, then you will force your opponent to surrender if you've killed enough of his or inflicted enough casualties uh, on his force. Another way is if, if you've managed to, even if he hasn't reached his sur surrender marker, if you eliminate all of his units off of the board, yeah, then that's another way the game could end immediately. So you got like four or five different possibilities for a game to just suddenly come to a stop. The most common one is the sudden death. You go all the way through the prescribed time, and then you're just duking it out to see who can get that last couple of points to swing the victory points to their side. This is a zero-sum victory point schedule, meaning that every time I earn points, I'm taking them away from you if you're already in the lead, and I, and I bring it back toward my side. So ultimately, I will hit the zero mark, and then those victory points will come back to my side. Let's talk about the actual units that make up the game, because this is a squad level game. We have three types of units here. We have squads, which are represented by four individuals on there. We have teams, two-man teams, and then we have leaders, which have a single silhouetted individual on them. Across the bottom, you have three capability measurements. And they are all the same for all of the individual pieces. The left side is their base firepower. Whatever their personal weapons are, M1 Carbine, M1 Garand, whatever. That is, uh, that is their base firepower. The middle number is their range and hexes that they can shoot. So Sergeant Smith has a range of one, so he can shoot anything up to one hex away. Whereas these line, this line team can go out to four hexes, one, two, three, four. So they can see things as far away as this. And the line squad has six hexes of range. And then the number on the far right is their movement points. So uh, you can see that Sergeant Smith himself, he can go up to six movement points, and I'm not saying hexes, I'm saying specifically movement points because you spend them differently depending on the terrain that you're covering. And you can see both of the, the, oops, the squad and the team have the ability to move four points worth. Okay. You also notice that some of them have box boxes around different aspects of their characteristics. That will come into play when we talk about the cards. That usually means it denotes that it's imbuing them with some special capability that if used in conjunction with card play, they can throw out smoke grenades or they can perform an assault fire. Or if it's a, uh, a weapon with that capability, that weapon can be used in a couple of different ways. Okay, so that's, those are our humans. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have also a leader up here known as the hero. 
and these will only come out during a random event. So you won't always have a hero in a game, but when they do, they're they're quite nice. That's your Audie Murphy if we're using real World War II, or it's our Jefferson from the Dirty Dozen. It's somebody that is going above and beyond, and you can see that they have he has a seven movement, which is pretty good, um, and he also has a greater range and eh, about the same firepower capability. What's special about the hero is that. Unlike everything else here, any of these units, they can only have one order performed on them during your turn. But heroes, they're completely different. They break the rules of the game. You can perform multiple orders on those heroes in one turn. So if you've got a handful of cards, you can just keep, you can tell Lucas to run over there, grab that, uh, assault this, and go into melee. So they have the capability to do some pretty cinematic things. Then we have weapons up here. We have squad-based weapons. So we have a medium machine gun here. Notice it has two numbers. The first number is its base firepower, of course. Second one is its range. Obviously, it has a dash because it's carried. It doesn't move on its own. Some of them will have, like this light mortar above it, that negative number in red is an encumbrance. So any unit that is carrying that, so let's say this line squad is carrying that, it's going to reduce their movement by two points because of that. So encumbrance is another little management here. The other numbers on there, of course, are the firepower. And then it has a range of a minimum of two and a, and a maximum of 16, which is essentially from corner to corner on these maps. So it can, it can hit any, almost anywhere on the map. We also have radios. Radios are not in every scenario, but this is how you call in off-board artillery. And you can see that there's a number here with, this is its base firepower, and whether or not it has the capability to apply smoke, which is very handy in certain aspects of this game. So that is your overview of the counters. Then we can move on to the, the soul of the game, which is the cards. The cards have an incredible amount of information on them, and I've organized them into groups here on this side, and then some information over here that we're going to talk about on this other group of cards. But these are the basic mechanics that everybody wants to do on their turn, and I've kind of grouped them into logical pairings here. We've got moving, and we've got advancing. We've got firing, we've got uh, recover cards and route cards, and they are played a little differently, but you'll see uh, when I talk about them momentarily, they'll, they'll be pretty apparent. Then we have artillery request and artillery denied, which again de is dependent on actually having a radio in that scenario, otherwise those orders are useless. And then you have the truly useless card, the command confusion, which is just uh, trash. Trash cards that will pile up in your hand unless you can figure out a way to use them in some other method, which we'll talk about with actions. So we mentioned up here that depending on what the order of battle is in the scenario, you're going to have a number of orders that you can perform from your hand. And that is what is across the top here. That is specific to these cards. An action, on the other hand, is the second line of information here. And you can see there's a lot of additional capabilities and trickery and, and sort of fun that you can do, capabilities that you can perform at any time. I will say that again for emphasis. You can play actions at any time, even if it's not your turn, as long as you meet the criteria of what is written on the card. And it is very specific on most of these. It says, you know, if X, then Y. And so if that capability is met, you can play those. And another common question is, can you do more than one? Absolutely. You've got three or four. Uh, one of the things I like to do a lot are smoke grenades here on the fire cards. And if you are trying to approach the enemy with stealth, if you have three or four smoke grenades in your hand, that's really good to have because you can move up, throw out some smoke grenades, move into the smoke, throw out some smoke grenades ahead of you, and you just keep doing that and building this line of obscured vision as you approach the enemy. 
So those actions can be played as many of them as you can from your hand. And it's often a good way, like we see here with this, this, this uh, command confusion, of getting trash cards out of your hand. So let's talk about the individual orders themselves. We have move and we have advance, and there's a little bit of difference on those. It's uh, one of the fundamentals of this game. So I'm going to bring a this line unit over here, and we can see that he has a four movement point value. So if I played a movement, I can either play any order either on a single unit, or I can play it on a leader. If I play it on the leader, then any and all units within their command radius, which I have not talked about yet, but here, that's this number here in the hex. So Lucas has a command radius of zero, and Smith has a command radius of two. So if I played a move order on Sergeant Smith, then he could then activate all units, not other leaders, but any and all subordinate units within two hexes of him to all perform that same order which is the most effective way because this is a game about command and control. So if I play that on Smith, I would activate him, and then I would activate this line unit and this line unit, and they would all be able to, to perform a move order. And then they could move whatever their movement allowance is. So this line unit could move uh, into this building, for example, and a building requires two movement points to move into, so he'd spend half his movement just entering the building. And then you can always move into an open space for one, but there's this hedge here, and that's typically a plus one to movement cost of whatever you're moving into. So he'd have to move his last two points to get over that hedge or through the hedge and then into the open there. So that he would have spent all four of his movement points just going from here to here. Um, if you have a unit that is ever stacked with a leader in the same hex, then as long as they are with that leader, not only does this command value apply to his range in hexes, but that's a bonus that he gives to all the stats of that subordinate unit that is stacked. So basically, Sergeant Smith would give a two bonus to every single one of those lines, firepower, range, and movement, so they would become a 5-6-6 six, six, as long as they're in that same hex with Smith. But the moment they leave the same hex as Smith, they lose that capability. So if he wants to move with them, now they would have six movement points, so they could go 1-2 uh, in the safety of the building, 3-4, and then say 5-6 over the hedge into the open. One of the problems with movement is that while you're playing a move order, you're enemy can perform opportunity fire and opportunity fire will often wreck your entire day so for every hex that that smith and this unit move into now my opponent has a chance to play an opportunity fire action and start shooting at me and every hex that i go into he can take another shot at me so that is increasing the risk that i'm gonna get broken. That is one thing I did not mention. Let's say that I'm moving and I get shot. We will have this number in the upper right hand corner which represents our defensive value. I haven't talked about combat yet but this is a good time to just mention what this number represents. This is the, mor the base morale of that unit and anytime that you are fired upon you will make an opposed ch check between the attacker's firepower and this morale plus a die roll, and those new two numbers are compared in whichever one is the higher and is going to win out. So if I make a morale check that's not as high as a firepower check that's coming in on me, then this unit will break, and that means a flip to their backside. And the first flip will usually degrade their capabilities pretty significantly. In some cases, the Americans actually get more stalwart uh, they, they become an 8, so on subsequent checks they would be working with an 8 plus a die roll number. If they're ever forced to break again, then they would actually become eliminated, and they would go to the casualty track. So that is what we're trying to avoid at all costs. Roads also enhance movement, 
So if you're moving, if you enter a road hex at any one point, then you automatically get a plus one to your movement for the rest of the, uh, the order. So in this case here, they have four movement, they move onto the road, and now technically they have five total points. So they spent one, two, three, four, and let's say he was trying to go off the map for whatever reason, he could still have one point because he went onto a road. So roads are very handy on this road, but they're a blessing and a curse. They help you move faster, but as we're going to see, they're harder to perform defense checks against morale checks because those are negative modifiers for being out there in the open. Let's talk about the difference between moving and advancing. Advancing means that Smith is going to tell everybody simply to advance into one adjacent hex. That's the, the entirety of the move, is they go from one hex into another hex. That's it. But why that's important is twofold. One, they can't get shot at. You can never perform opportunity fire against someone on an advance order. So it's very safe, but it's slow. You're just incre in incrementally getting closer to the enemy. Uh, the other reason this is important, I'm going to pull out an, uh, pull one from here. Let's say I've got this Falschermjäger here. The only way you can engage in melee or hand-to-hand -hand combat is with an advance order. So if I were to move, Smith could only move up next to them. But if I actually wanted to get into melee combat, I'd have to perform an advance order, which is when I can go into their hex and we will, will immediately go into a melee combat check, which we'll talk about a little bit later when we get to some more information about combat. So that's the difference between moving and advancing. Firing, obviously, that is pretty significant in this game of combat. So we're gonna, I'm gonna put these false makers here in this house. And a fire order allows you to, again, either activate a single unit or a leader and additional units within his command radius to perform a fire attack on a target. And the way it works is you will total up the capability of the fire. You would indicate if there are multiple units, you'll indicate which one is taking the lead on the fire. And then any additional units that are participating in a fire group will add simply plus one. I think a lot of times new players are like, they just add up all of the individual firepower values. That's not the case. It's uh, simply just say, I'm going to make the line unit. They're going to be the, the primary on this. And then this line unit next to me, next to them, where the sergeant is, he also can add plus one to that. And even if the sergeant was within range, unfortunately, they're two away instead of one. But if they were adjacent, he could also pull out his little 45 and uh, and shoot as well. But in this case, both of these units are going to just be a six plus one, seven, and then I would attack with a die roll. So I haven't even talked about all of the card stuff yet, but you get an idea. We're going to come back to that. So that's firing. Firing also lets you activate ordnance weapons. Um, the ordnance weapons here have a white stripe. So anytime you see that, that's known as indirect fire. And it works in a two-step process where you activate the light mortar to fire, but you have to make a range check to see if you actually can hit the target. So let's say um, I've got this false Jaeger here, and I'm attempting to fire that light mortar at it and I can see that it's four hexes away, I would first have to check to see that I could... I will roll... I'll pull a card here just to show you how it works. Uh, I will roll die, and all the dice here are located on the cards. I will multiply those two numbers together, and if it's at least, in this case, one better than the distance, which is four, so I'd need a five or better, pretty easily. I got 24, so that's not a not a problem. I, a, I scored a pretty good hit. Then I could actually attack with the firepower that's printed on the marker. So ordnance always requires a two-hit roll and then a subsequent firepower check if you do make the hit. All right, let's talk about recover and routing. 
um, two sides of kind of the same coin. Let's say that this line unit here has gotten broken. If I don't want him to be broken anymore, I can attempt to do a recover order. And a recover order will let me, if I had multiple units broken, what I will do is I will go one at a time and I will check all of the units to see if they recover. And what I have to do is roll below their printed number, morale check, plus any in additional enhancements based on cover or leadership. What's nice is being stacked with Sergeant Smith here, he gives a command bonus uh, of two, so that would increase that number from seven to nine. So now I have to just roll a die and see if I get, in this case I got a six, so that's lower than nine, so they would successfully rally. And I would do that for every single unit that's out there. Okay. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, usually at the wrong time. Uh, a route works the opposite way. Let's say this uh, unit, this German unit is over here, and that's his side of the map. And I perform a route on him. Then I will check any and all of my opponent's broken units, and I will do the same thing. I'm trying to pull cards in such a way that I will get higher than their morale plus any terrain modifiers, in which case that will force them to move back the difference. So if I, in this case here, I think this cover is one for this brush, so he's a nine. Let's say I, I pull an 11. He's forced to move back the difference, which is two hexes, and in this case that would take him off the map, and that would be like eliminating the unit, because I've caused him to flee in terror from the battlefield, and that would give me some points. So that's how routing works. It's the opposite of recovery. You're taking advantage of broken units of your opponents. You can play routes on yourself. It's not always the best thing to do, but it's a good way to get rid of a card. It's kind of a gamey tactic where if you know that unit is like at 11 or 12, he's ensconced in the building, he's got a leader, there's just no way he's going to run away, but you want to get that card out of your hand, you can play a route and say, I'm playing it on my own units. And if you only have one broken unit, great. You do that check, and everything works out fine, and you just get rid of the card. So that is one tactic that you can use to get rid of some cards uh, that you might, might not otherwise be able to use. Patrick, can I jump in here? Absolutely. OK, two other things about uh, route recover. Um, the other really useful thing for routing on yourself is if you've got guys broken out in the open, and then you can back them up into better cover. That is an excellent use of uh, routing, even though your guys are going the wrong direction. Um, at least they're not stuck out in the open, still getting shot at. And these two cards activate players, not units. Very good. Which is significant. Yes. So you can't recover and route yourself on the same turn because you have been activated by one of those, which stops you from playing the other card in that same turn. Perfect. This is exactly where I was going with that. So great timing. Yes, these are not played on units. They're played on what I like to call the body or the player. So if I play a route on you, I can still do a recover on me. But if I, uh, like Kai said, I can't do both on the same turn on myself. I couldn't do a route and recovery. So exactly. Artillery requests and denied. As I said, if you don't have a radio, well, there, that doesn't help you very much. So they are kind of a dead card. But if I do have a radio, and that's usually down here in the radio box, then this is my opportunity to call HQ and ask for offboard artillery bombardment. And it works the same way as this ordinance where you are going to first make a check. It has to be used by a leader, um, can also be used by a hero, and that's one of my favorite things is if you've got a handful of those and you've got a hero out there, he just keeps calling in the artillery over and over again. But they have to be activated. They have to be not broken, of course. Most most of the orders that let you do anything significant require you have to be in good order. Uh, obviously, the radio ha cannot be broken, so you'll see that the radio can be broken here through the use of the artillery denied card. If somebody has been hoarding those denied cards and they play them immediately back to back, they can break it and then immediately that second one will eliminate the radio. 
and that's that's no fun once the artillery request is is gone out then you can depending on the radio you can either request a bombardment which is straight up uh, fire for effect you can do smoke or if it's a nighttime scenario mostly in the Pacific you can request star shells to illuminate a particular area of the battlefield but uh, let's say I do a bombardment I will full, first pull out a spotting round and I want to come over here and get rid of this unit nearby I have to make a check on the distance to that target and if I succeed there's going to be a little bit of a drift. It's possible that it's going to move a couple in one direction or it'll go up and back or something like that. Or if I miss horribly, then it's possible it could drift all the way back onto me and really spoil my day. So artillery request is a lot of fun, but it, it can go horribly wrong if, if the dice go against you. Let's talk about a couple other things all related to the cards. So I have this command confusion card here that is obviously a null order, but this shows you all of the information that is encapsulated on each one of these 72 cards. So for our statisticians out there, we can see that there are dice on there. It's a 2d6. So we've got 1 to 36 repeated twice. So there's two snake eyes uh, all the way up through box cars, right? In which case, this is performed by using here in the vassal module we have all of them already preset on these tools to roll dice for us pull events for us or do random hexes so when i do a random hex here it'll actually draw a little outline for me on the map okay so the entire generation of combat commander is based completely on information derived from these cards. You'll do all of your dice rolls in, in a physical copy, you'd just be flipping over, and I rolled a 2-3 on this case. You can see in the lower left-hand part of the card is the corresponding hex numbers for a random hex draw. And then we also have all of the events that can potentially come up in the game are also on these cards. And that's why I've put aside these other cards to show you what the triggers look like. The triggers can be any one of these jammed means that when you're firing, for example, I'm firing this medium machine gun, if I pull a jam, it becomes broken. Okay, and it uh, it's left up to future chance and random numbers to determine whether or not it's going to get fixed or if it's completely eliminated. Okay, I also have snipers, which represent kind of abstracts all of the battlefield sniping that's going on. So when you pull that, you will pull a random hex like I did up here and I got this N4. Then I would be allowed to break a unit in or adjacent to that random hex. So that's a good way to just, hey, oh, there's a leader standing by and you just break a leader. So that's handy. Then the events. So anytime you draw this and there are sound effects that are part of this particular vassal module, when you pull an event, you will then flip over the next card and you will refer to the event text portion of the card. And it can be anything from reinforcements, as we see here. We see booby traps, command and control. This is a way to just points will just suddenly be awarded to you because of things that you've controlled. Um, this is a good opportunity to talk about the objective locations. Every map has five objective locations pre printed on them. Okay. Unless otherwise, determined by one of these objectives that are already pre-programmed or in this situation will draw some hidden objectives that each side will have you don't know what the value of those particular objectives are until they become revealed through either the end of the game or something that says reveal that objective so only you will have some information about what one of these objectives may be worth to you and it could be significant. It could be anything from one point to five points. And some of them will be like, uh, if you hold all the objectives at sudden death, you instantly win. So some of them can be pretty significant and they can stack up. So you can get multiples on, let's say this objective down here, five. It could be worth two victory points. And then through an event saying, draw an open objective, it could be another one that says, like I pull another one out here and it says, oh, okay, 
three is worth one, but I could have just as easily pulled another one that said five is worth ten or five or whatever. So these open objective chits, as soon as they come up, you immediately assess any vocations that are already under control from one side or another, and you assign those points immediately. So this victory point track is very fluid during the game. It, it moves around quite a bit. So that was the event trigger, and then finally is the time trigger. There are two ways that time advances in this game. Either you draw one of these time triggers, and as soon as you do that, you'll, you'll hear the ticking of the clock, and then you will use this button. I'm going to just push it up here just real quick, and then I'll undo it. But as soon as you push this button, it sweeps everything away, essentially, and it moves the time marker to the next time spot. And you will go through a series of steps to do a little bit of basic cleanup, like if these reinforcements were ready to come in right now, we'd place reinforcements. It is possible for people to play dig ins, which means they could dig foxholes in that little interim period. In all cases, in the defender posture, you'll get a victory point as time advances. So the defender, you, you are constantly getting a point for each one of those. So those are guaranteed points provided you last the entirety of the game. I think I've covered most everything on the cards. Any questions so far? Fantastic. Well, then we are, I think, ready to do some, some in-depth examples here. So in this situation here, we've got this scenario is called uh, Training Day. And because it's recon, I'm going to pull this back up again. We'd have the allies starting on the right-hand side and the axis starting on the left-hand side. Um, so we would go through and set this up completely based on all of these things. Most everything is in here, but I, I've kind of moved everything about for it. But then you would play through as long as the, the sudden death time would uh, allow. But uh, I, I just want to show some examples of how a fire attack works. Let's put this Falsham Jaeger back here. And let's say he's off in the woods. And we're going to do this. I'm going to put Sergeant Smith here. Um, let's talk about terrain for a moment because uh, that is a critical part of when you're performing attacks. So that obviously being able to read the map is key to any of these scenarios that you're playing. We have a variety of terrain. I'm going to uh, open up my little terrain chart here. And what's really wonderful about the terrain chart is there's this dashed line here that runs across it. And uh, what I love about it is it's a hierarchy. So everything above the dashed line on this chart indicates that that is to tell you what the hex is. So at the very bottom you, hear, you see all things being equal, nothing else in it. It's just open ground, which we see many examples of on this map. And then as you move up the chart towards the top, then if there are multiple things in the same hex, then it tells you what it is. So we have some urban maps that are very crowded and, and people are like, well, is it this or is it that? I see both. I'm like, well, just because you have this in there, it's still, you know, if you have woods uh, and a building, then the building takes precedence because the building is the higher thing. So if you read this chart, go all the way to the top and it will tell you whenever there's a mixture of two features in a hex, what it, it is. I think a lot of people with other wargaming backgrounds will look at the center dot and say, oh, it's, it's this, because that's where the dot is. That's not how it works in Combat Commander. It just will tell you what the feature type is based on where it is in the hierarchy. Everything below the dashed line will be enhancements or modifications to whatever feature type you're in. So, for example, uh, if I have woods, I do have woods right here, over here at objective four. Those are woods, so they've got a cover of two, but because I have a road running through them, that road is modifying the cover and subtracting it by one. So the net cover of those woods now becomes one instead of two. Same with a building, I've got the 
uh, this hex is a building hex, but it does have a road running through it. So it's a net cover of two because it's three for the building, but that road modifies it down by one to a two. So once you learn that uh, you look at the hierarchical structure of the terrain type and then any enhancements or modifications on it, then you it becomes second nature for you. Uh, the other factor is line of sight. Line of sight works uh, in such a way that, let's say, this unit is here. Okay, He's not in the greatest of cover, but Sergeant Smith wants to perform a, a fire action on them. So I'm going to do a line of sight just to show you. And I can see that he's four hexes away, and he is shooting through these two hexes of brush, which means that it's going to reduce the effectiveness of the firepower based on the hindrance of that uh, terrain type. So that terrain type was was brush right here, and we look at it, it's two to move through it, it's one cover, so that unit that's in it is going to get a one cover, but it reduces the firepower by three. So, so let's do the front end, the positives, so it's a, the line unit is going to be shooting, it's a six, they get the two bonus for Sergeant Smith, so that's an eight, but they're shooting through this hindrance here, so it's going to reduce it by three, so it would be five plus whatever the die roll is. So I'm going to roll a die, it's five plus, very nice shot. We have some eagle-eyed spotters through there. So I would just, for my opponent up here, I'd say, oh, okay, I rolled... 11 plus the 5 is 16. So 16 is now the number in uh, the, the Falschermager have to beat with their morale check. And the morale check works this way. So it's 8, they get 1 cover because they're in the brush, so that's 9, and then they will also roll a 2d6 and add that number. So uh, I'm not in there as the, as the Germans, but I'll roll a die for them and just say they're 9 plus and they roll a total of 12. And that is not enough to beat the firepower number, so that would cause them to break. Okay, That's how combat works. It's really just that easy. It's just two opposed rolls. You add up all the die roll modifiers for the, for the shooter, and check that against the, the morale of the unit that's being fired upon with any terrain or leadership bonuses. And, of course... I mentioned that I could also play actions, so I could throw in things like if I had a machine gun there, I have a card called Sustain Fire, which would give me plus two because I'm shooting machine gun. Little things like that I could just keep piling on and adding modifiers to get stuff out of my hand or to enhance the capabilities of my firepower attack. So all of those are, are factors. Now, you heard me talk that you could use, you can do up to three orders, but one of the things you can do is, of course, to discard cards. So, discard is based on the different nationalities. I believe the Germans have six, the Americans have five, I'm doing this off of memory, the British four, all the way down to the French who get one discard, and that has caused a great deal of consternation in our ranks, because that makes it pretty challenging when you got a handful of trash as the French to try to discard one card at a time. But yes, you can discard up to the amount allowed by your nationality. So if I have a handful of crap, that is also part of, you know, knowing when to get rid of cards. If I don't have a radio and there's no usable actions on there, well, I I might consider getting rid of it. But in, in lieu of my turn, I'm in recon status. Uh, I don't have a machine gun, or at least I'm not prepared to do a sustain fire. I might consider discarding that and drawing back up, in which case that would be my turn. So you can either play orders, you can discard, or you can, quote, pass, which is basically discarding zero. That is your turn. Okay. Notice also, uh, I'm going to zoom in on this here. Um, I have this... I have some capabilities that are specified as defender only. So if you have them, in this case I'm in the recon posture, I can't use this hidden wire card because I'm not set to the defender for this scenario. So that is also a consideration where, well, I don't have a radio, 
and I don't have, I'm not the defender, so this card is completely and totally useless to me in my hand right now. And there will be, come a time when you have more crap in your hand than you want. And discarding is a natural part of this game. A lot of people hate that. They don't like the, uh, I want to do this. They want that perfect hand. They want to be able to do whatever they want. And you have to get over that. <laughs> That's just not how Combat Commander works. So, uh, questions? Well, we're right at 9 o'clock. So, I might be ahead, but I, I do I do want to talk about a couple other things here. I want to talk about the random scenario generator, but I will certainly take questions while I take a swig of, of water. Did you talk about the initiative card? I have not talked about the initiative card. Thank you. Man, you're the best. I need to have you do this all the time. So the initiative card, right there. Uh, the initiative card is a wonderful opportunity for the players to force a re-roll of any die roll. So if you get into a situation where that leader that you love so much is about to die because your opponent rolled really really well then you can surrender the initiative card and pass it to in this case I'd pass it to the access player and force a re-roll okay and that can be used for anything that is truly a die roll there are some things that you are pulling a card you're consulting the dice but they are not die rolls but this is also the the, the two most frequent uses of the initiative card are in melee combat where the two units have gotten into that same hex and one unit, one side is going to completely eliminate the other side potentially, that card will oftentimes pass hands back and forth because you're forcing a reroll of a die and, oh, they rolled better than I wanted. Oh, no. So here, you know, take the die and then back forth, back forth. Or it often happens at sudden death when you're perhaps just one or two points away from winning, you just need a little more time to uh, to move on to get your plan into operation. Then you can pass you can pass that to the person who's performed the sudden death check and force a reroll. Now it certainly never works out in my favor. You know, I, I give up the initiative card and it still goes horribly. But that is what it's there for: is is forcing a reroll of of uh, any die roll. I talked about the time trigger coming up on the cards on the box card, but the other way that the time naturally advances as I'm opening the card window here is because we have the 72 cards each, whenever you deplete your deck, whoever depletes their deck, they will perform the time trigger operation, reset their deck, perform all the steps, and so as we go through our individual decks and the time triggers are coming up, that's going to get out of sync. If you're doing about three orders a piece, most people are utilizing the decks at about the same pace. You can oftentimes, especially here in the Vassal window, you can look and see that, oh, there's a 72 and I've got 64, and they'll usually be, you know, within maybe 10% of each other. But once one person forces a time trigger or a time trigger comes up and they've reset their card deck, now you've got one person at 30 cards left and one person's at 70 cards left and it's just going to be this uh, oh no you don't you don't know how quickly the game is going to go because there are time triggers in there and there are decks that are about to be emptied one of the things one of the we have a whole list of axioms that we've come up with on the combat commander ladder and one of them is just that you, you never have enough time just when you think oh this game's taken forever you could have three time triggers just back to back to back. I played a game in November at, at BGGCon. I uh, got to play with one of our ladder members face to face. It was wonderful. He shuffled his deck. He said, do you want to cut the deck? I said, no, that's okay. Flipped over the card. Next card was time. Okay, that's cool. That's on me. And then shuffles the deck again. You want to cut it this time? Yes, I want to cut it this time. I cut it. The next card he flipped, time. So that's going to happen. That is just, <laughs> the the cards are always out to get you in Combat Commander. That's just the way I always feel. Uh, let's see, we've talked about moving, we've talked about combat, morale checks. Let's see, what else? Let me, I want to I wanna just take a quick side note and point to the uh, Combat Commander rulebook, which is, as far as I'm concerned, and I know most people will agree with me, the gold standard for rulebooks for war games. 
not only do you get just sort of the base core rules within the first five or six pages, but then after that, everything is just strictly dependent on whether you're playing an order, you're looking at an action, they're organized by what's on the card. So if you need information about how the fire action or the fire order works, you go in there and those two pages are specific to this is how conducting a fire attack works and, and line of sight and elevation. A lot of stuff I'm not going to get to tonight as far as, um, you know, specifics to the individual rules. But those are all things that you, you pick up as you're going through. One of the things you have to understand is the, the rules mean exactly what they say on the card. We please do not infer anything. You don't say, well, you know, it could mean this. No, no, it says what it means, and it, you play it as it says. So once you get into that headspace, this game is incredibly fun when you're playing with folks that are also in that same headspace. So uh, I, I can't speak highly enough for how wonderful uh, I've loved the rule book. I remember the first time I ever read it, I was like, this is unlike anything I've ever read, and I didn't understand it because I didn't have the context of the game. Some will say that, well, it's not a great way to learn the game. Perhaps I'm hoping that this video may help people, but if you ever need it as a reference tool, it is, it is wonderful for just that. Let's do a, I'll do an example here of a uh, artillery request card I had out. Uh, let's say that uh, Sergeant Smith wants to follow up in the subsequent turn, and he's going to do this bombardment. He's going to attempt to drop uh, high explosives on those, those German paratroopers in the brush there. So he knows that they're one, two, three, four away. There is hindrance. So the hindrance is factored in on his distance check. So that line of sight adds three to that. So now he's four away plus three more is a seven. So I need an eight or better multiplied on two dice to score a direct hit. So I have to score, I roll the die. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the channel. This is exactly what happens in pretty much every game I ever play. Snake Eyes. So that is a major miss. Now, because it's a major miss, I will now roll another set of dice. This time it will tell me, down here, we see this uh, compass rose, or compass hex in this case. It will tell you the direction on the first die, and then the distance on the second die. And that will be how it's going to drift errantly. So, it's going to go two, direction two, which is this way, and it would go six hexes, which is going to just take it all the way off the map. So that is a major miss. Let's presume that that didn't happen, or maybe won't happen again. Let's try another one. So I need to be at a seven. Nope, still didn't. There we go. So three times three is nine. That would be enough for a on-target hit with a minor drift. So I will now check the minor drift. The difference here is it's you look at the two numbers as one hex in each of those directions. So it's going to drift just a little bit. In this case, we have an event, but that doesn't happen. So it would go like this. It would go direction three on the first number, and then direction four. So it would drift just enough that it would not even be a factor, because when it explodes, it hits all seven of the hexes both in and around that spotting rounds location. So that would be enough of a miss that I would I'd be cranky and I would just say, you know, next order. So that's how that would work. No, Patrick? Yes. I just thought of the one more thing with the um, initiative card. Uh -huh. And it comes up way more often than you would ever think. If the game ends um, by the standard sudden death and you're looking at victory points, if the victory points stand at zero, meaning neither side holds an advantage. Whoever holds that card wins. And I can't tell you how many games have come right down to zero and check who's got that card. And it's usually someone who has just given it during or triggered that end of game sequence and they're kicking themselves for it. That's a lot more than you think. Story of my life. Some people will, uh, we, we have the joke of you hold on to the initiative card for grim death. Everything's exploding around you. Your know, bodies are flying, and I'm not giving up the initiative card. I'm not giving up, and then you will just for that last little thing because you're just you're just so 
flummoxed by everything, and you're like, okay, take it. And then, yeah, sudden death, and then you're you're tied, and that person has, has won by default, because it is one point in their favor. So that is a very important element of, of the initiative card, is it is a point to break the tie at the end of the game. Let's talk about the random scenario generator. So in, and, and Kai, please uh, correct me on this one, originally the concept that Chad came up with on the game was that um, here, here are the tools to make your own combat commander scenarios, have fun, go to it. And I, I'm, I'm, un, I'm under the impression, or I've, I, I've heard, I think, that GMT was like, yeah, we really need to package some scenarios with this. So he came up with a bunch of sin- historical scenarios, added some, you know, nice little historical narrative flavor to them, and put them on cards, and those became the initial 12, and then they did 12 more for Mediterranean. And then, obviously, that's the, the, the core of the... The battle packs is they give you some some additional maps and some historical scenarios. Well, the game itself, a, a significant part of the game, and, and here I am just in, in seven years of the Combat Commander ladder, we finally have enough people that are dipping their toes into the, the random scenario stuff. And I've done a few videos on that. We, I had a few cheerful volunteers, and and that is such a wonderful little meta game unto itself where you are picking orders of battle and you're comparing them. I, I'm not going to go through the entire process. I'm going to show you uh, a couple of quick little tools that are here. We have one of them is this little RSG tool, which will do it in 30 seconds for you. But half of the fun of it is is getting into that... Okay, let's roll up. Oh, we ended up with a, a 1941 scenario. Okay, it's going to be Russians versus Germans. Okay, and then, you know, you have to figure out, am I going to take a small platoon of people? Am I going to take just a detachment of people? Or am I going to take a, a full-on company and just try to overwhelm him with Russians? And depending on the size and makeup of the units and the quality of the units that you're available then you will spend victory points and give them to your opponent. Likewise, they will do the same, and they will offset, and that number will arrive somewhere around the center point here of this victory point track. And from that, you will then make determinations of, oh, okay, you are the attacker, you are the defender, and do I get to spend points on fortifications? Can I buy support weapons, squad support weapons, etc.? Do I get a radio for artillery bombardments? All of those wonderful things. It really is a sandbox. It's so much fun. And we're finally getting people to realize, wow, there's just so much in it. I didn't even realize. And what's more than anything, people are like, these are so incredibly balanced. And, and rightfully so, because since it's all determined based on that movement of the victory points back and forth, back and forth, to that zero sum, that everything at the beginning of the scenario is completely close to balance. Everything has been offset by, you know, whatever advantages you've given yourself versus your opponent, he's going to get some kind of offset in victory points. And because of all that, the true balanced nature, that is the one comment I keep seeing over and over again on uh, the people that have played one uh, just as a one-off one evening, like, oh my gosh, I didn't think I stood a chance with the Italians, but it was so balanced that, you know, I won because I was holding the initiative card or, you know, whatever. And they, they've been very close games. Some of the data that we've seen with some of the historical scenarios, they are fun, but many of them after 20 years now, some of some of the people that have played them a bit, they figured out the little tricks for some of the scenarios, and you know, they're, each one of them have a little recipe that you can you can exploit, I think, to to win them. But that's not always 100% because you could have a lousy hand of cards and la- lousy dice rolls and and everything. So nothing is ever guaranteed in Combat Commander, but the RSG is. A, a wonderful way to do that, and I'm just going to show you this button right up here. Um, when you click this button with an extension that's been added, it does a lot of the presets for you. So I'm going to play the axis, and we're going to use map 37 for the scenario, and the axis will be set up on the right side of the map. The year is 1942. Um, the axis player will play as Italy using line quality troops. So it will just predetermine everything for you, and then 
we will make our order of battle selections, which we did not put them intentionally in here. They are on the back side of these support tables, but on the support cards, this is for sort of uh, this is for any random reinforcements that will come up during the game, or for when you're purchasing squad support weapons, you can use these here. So I, as the Italians, I could make purchases based on this, but I will select my actual order of battle complement from the opposite side of this card, which you need the physical copy to, to play. And uh, then you go through all the steps there. You know, you, you bring out the objectives, and you set up the order of battle, and you roll for leaders, and you do your support rolls, and determine the posture, and you just... And it's a very easily regimented repeat set of instructions that if you're just doing this in an evening, uh, either on the table or on Vassal, you know, it's 15-20 minutes, and you've got a unique scenario to you on some map with some, you know, you're playing a game ostensibly that no one's ever played before, and if you like it, you can save it, and you could make it into a, you could submit it for publication, or punch it up with some historical narrative or whatever. That's the brilliance of it, is that uh, you could share it with your friends and see how they do. So the, the RSG really, to me, once you get to a certain, once you've played most of the scenarios, you're like, okay, these are great, but what can I make on my own? And that's, that is, I can't say enough about that either. So do explore the random scenario generator if you've not done so yet. Um... I don't know what else I have for you. I can't think of anything. We we haven't done any like really heavy duty practical stuff, but I don't want to belabor some of the the ease at which you can you can pick up the stuff. Most everything is opposed roles. Um, everything that you'll need is on the cards. The cards have a nice normal distribution of twice, so you get 72 cards. And uh, yeah. It's it's a lot of fun, and I will I will wrap it up with this because I figured I, I couldn't not do in this you know we got to have Jefferson doing his amazing scene through to try to blow up the come on Jefferson you got to do it that is what it's like to have a hero in combat commander so I want to thank everybody for joining me here tonight. Uh, if you have any questions after the fact, you feel free, as long as they're leaving the Discord server open, you can leave them in the text channel. I'll be glad to set you up with a, an answer, or at least point you in the right direction. Also point out that, uh, yes, I have recorded this. This is going to end up on the channel, so you can always refer back to it if you need to, and certainly feel free to, uh, to ask comments there in the YouTube video section. I'd be happy to answer those. But uh, I appreciate everybody tonight. I think we had like 40 people signed up, so I hope we actually ended up getting that many out there tonight. Um, again, thank you for being here today for the San Diego HistCon, and uh, thank you for being here tonight. Have a great one.